children, if you have a young one who wants to go to children's church, they can follow Miss Kimberly out to my right over here, uh, and they can join her. If you have an older child, first through fifth grade, they're already downstairs in the youth room on this end of the building, downstairs, and they can join uh, that group down there if they'd like to. Acts chapter 13, you can't go, Glenn. <laughs> Acts chapter 13, where we're going to be today as we continue uh, walking through the book of Acts and looking at how God has worked through His Holy Spirit throughout history. And today we're talking about the simple truth. Uh, you know, we, we, we like, our world likes to make truth complicated. But really and truthfully, the truth is, is pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple uh, when you get right down to it. When you start trying to add to it or make your own truth or, uh, or divide it up into, into different things, it, it can get convoluted. But honestly, when we just truly follow the scriptures, and we truly just look at the Word of God, truth becomes pretty simple. And today, I want to share with you this, the simple truth. As Paul and, and Barnabas, in their first missionary journey, they're traveling through the region, and they leave the region we talked about last week, and they go over into um, Pisidian Antioch, is where they're at today, and they go into the synagogue to talk to the, the Israelites first, to talk to the Jews about truth, about the truth of the gospel, the truth of who they are, really and truthfully, the truth about the promises of God. You know, God's made all kind of promises in his word. God has talked to us over and over again. There, there are promises throughout scripture. You've heard many messages on the promises of God and talk about that, but sometimes we forget those promises. And, and we forget those promises because, you know, even though living the Christian life, for the most part, can be fairly easy when things are going your way. You add a little stress, a, a little hardship, a little bit of despair into our life, and we quickly can find ourselves at a mental fork in the road. We can <clears throat> find ourselves to, to rest in the promises of God is one way, and, or to go our own way and do our own thing is the other choice. God's promises are for you. They're for me. And even, even when they seem to be far away, even when they seem like we can't, maybe can't get to them, God's promises are there for us. You see, it's not difficult to sing when all is going well. But often God gives us, or, 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 or often God gives a special song to, the one, to, to one of his children who is hurting. One of those difficult times of their life. Believers find new joys in their nights of sorrow and despair, and they discover a greater closeness with the Lord during times of deep need. As we even look at Scripture and look through history, we find the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation while he was exiled on a barren island of Patmos. John Bunyan completed the classic that many of us have read, The Pilgrim's Progress, while in the Bedford Jail. Beethoven composed his immortal night symphony while totally deaf. And Fanny Crosby once remarked, if I had not lost my sight, I could never have written all the hymns that God gave me. One particular hymn, we want to talk about it by, the, uh, by a man by the name of Charles Weigel. We sang this hymn thousands of times in the church. It's entitled, No One Ever Cared for Me Like Jesus. That song was a product of one of the darkest periods in Charles Weigel's life. You see, Weigel spent most of his life as an itinerant evangelist and gospel songwriter traveling around the country and the world. And one day, after returning home from an evangelistic crusade, he found a note left by his wife of many years. The note simply said she had had enough of an evangelist's life. 
She was leaving him. Weigel later said that, that, that he became so despondent during the next several years that there were even times when he contemplated suicide. There was the terrible despair that no one really cared for him anymore. Gradually, his spiritual faith was restored, and he once again became active in his Christian ministry. Soon he felt compelled to write a song that would be a summary of his past tragic experience. And from a heart that had been broken came these choice words that God gave to Charles Weigel. And we sang them often, but it says, No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. The Apostle Paul, as he steps into Pisidian Antioch, as he steps into this synagogue on, a, the, first, on, the, <clears throat> on the Sabbath, and as he listens to the reading of the law and the prophets, <clears throat> he's asked to stand up, and he shares with this group a reminder of the promises of God. And today, uh, we, I think, need to be reminded of God's promises. We look around our, our world, and we see chaos. We see destruction. We see despair. We see all kinds of things. And we need to be reminded today that God is the same yesterday today and forever. And that no matter what my difficulty might be, no matter how, how good my life may be or how bad my life may be right now, God still cares about you. And as the Apostle Paul stood up in that room, in that synagogue, he shared some of these words. I'm not going to read the whole passage because it's a long passage, but I want to read part of it. And I'd ask you to stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's Word. As we think about the simple truths of God's promises. Beginning in verse 13, it says, Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. There's a little stressor. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they went uh, into the synagogue and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation or encouragement for the people, say it. Paul stood up and said, and motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. And then he, he walks to the next verses, or several verses are, he walks to a history. He gives them a, a quick history lesson about who they are in Christ, who they are, who that God chose them to be, what God has done for them, and how he has sent his son Jesus to be the Savior, how that they rejected him and crucified him, and he was raised to, to new life. But then I want to jump all the way down to verse 38. <clears throat> and we'll come back and look at all that in just a moment. But I, here's, the, here's the point of the whole message. Paul, after he gives them this history lesson, he reminds them of who they are and who Christ is. He says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Father, thank you for your word. Teach us according to it today, and we'll give you glory in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. You know, <clears throat> as we walk through this passage of Scripture this morning, I want to mention just a few things, but thinking about this aspect of what Paul has done and how Paul has, uh, is standing up. They, they're there in the synagogue. They've come to, to do, they're kind of following the same pattern that Jesus followed. Jesus, when he would go into a new city, he would admit, in, in, first of all, he would go to the people, the Jewish people. He'd go to the synagogue and he would stand up and proclaim the message. He would proclaim the truth to these, to these people. And then uh, if they accepted it, if they didn't accept it, they would, then he would move on out into the uh, the, the, the Gentiles or others and, and, and out into the highways and the hedges, you might say, and proclaim that message. So here we see uh, Paul and Barnabas. They come in. Uh, we, we talked about the stress in their life. John Mark, for whatever reason, we really don't, we're never really told. Uh, he decided to turn around and go back home. He didn't continue on the missionary journey, which created a lot of stress in Paul and Barnabas's relationship in life. Later on, on the second missionary journey, uh, Barnabas wanted to bring John Mark back along and Paul said, absolutely not. He deserted us the first time. I'm not giving him a second chance right now. 
Now, thankfully, later on in Paul's life, he did soften a little bit toward John Mark, but it created stress and created a, even a, a disbanding. And sometimes in the midst of those stresses, we have to remember all of who God is and all of what God has done for us. And so Paul and Barnabas are there. They go to the synagogue, as, as is the custom of the synagogue. They've gotten up and they've read the, the law and the prophets. In other words, they've read a portion of the, the writings of Moses in the first five books that we know as our Old Testament. They've read in some probably out of several of the prophets, maybe Isaiah and Jeremiah, uh, maybe Haggai, maybe others they've read that morning. Uh, they read some of the prophets. And, and then, obviously, the synagogue officials knew who Paul and Barnabas were. They understood what was happening, their ministry that they were there to do. And they invited them to, hey, would you want to stand up and share a word of exhortation or some translations say a word of encouragement to the people? And, of course, you know Paul. In Bar- he's not going to miss an opportunity to stand up and proclaim the gospel. So, so Paul jumps up, and he says there in verse 16, he says, he stood up and motioning with his hand, he said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. And then he goes on to remind them of the promise that God made to them. Uh, the promises that, that, that God had, the simple truth of the, of the promise of who they are. And, and really, this speaks to us today, too, because he begins in verse 17. He says, the God of this people, the God of Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it for a period of about 40 years. He put up with them. I love this text of Scripture. For a period of about 40 years, he put up with them. Don't you think we could probably say that in our churches a little bit today? For 2,000 years, God has put up with us. Uh, He's put up with how we act. He's put up with all the things we do that discredit him and disregard him. He put up with the nation of Israel. We all have read Exodus. I hope you have. And you know exactly what Paul means by that. Man, they were the, man, the grumpiest people. I mean, they get delivered out of Egypt. the, The Red Sea gets parted. And they're, I mean, the whole army of Pharaoh is is crushed in the the sea behind them and they're miraculously delivered like this and and they get just a few miles out in the wilderness and all of a sudden they don't have some water and what do they do oh god's never done anything for us we're going to starve to death we're going to die die dehydration out here did you not did you not see what he did yeah but isn't that how we are and I, i love that because paul says he put up with us He put up with the nation of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. And then he goes on to say, and then not only did he do that, when he had destroyed seven other nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them them judges until Samuel, the prophet. And then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And after he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king concerning whom he had also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all of my will. And from the descendants of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. In just a brief, short discourse, Paul takes Israel through their entire history. From the beginning when, uh, even though he didn't maybe, maybe necessarily mention it, he reminds them of the promise to Abraham. When he came to Abraham and said, hey, because of what happened back way back when, when the world chose to disregard me, he goes back even to Genesis. There's highlights here, implications here of going all the way back to when sin first entered the world. From that moment forward, when God promised Adam and Eve that one day he would raise up the son of woman who would become a savior, who would crush Satan's head and and take care of sin and and basically bring back what was tarnished through sin entering the world. He goes to and reminds him of the promise of Abraham and how that God was going to bless the whole nation through the descendants of Abraham. And then he goes through and reminds him of how God protected them uh, while they were in Egypt and how God not only protected them, but grew them and, and, and blessed them tremendously while they were there. Even though they were slaves in Egypt, God blessed them tremendously. Do we realize that God can bless us no matter what our circumstances are, that God can bless us no matter what our situation is. We don't have to necessarily be uh, even living in a free country to be blessed of God. I'm thankful we do, at least for now. But uh, I'm thankful that that God is blessing us, and it doesn't doesn't depend on our circumstances. Look how God blessed uh, Israel when they were in Babylon, when they were in captivity in Babylon for those 70 years. Look at how God blessed them over and over and over again. 
But Paul is reminding the Israelites, he's reminding the Jews that you have been chosen, but you haven't been chosen for what you think. You have been chosen for a purpose to usher into the world the Savior of the world. He gave them that brief history of how they went through the judges and how that God blessed them through that. And he always, always raised up somebody to lead. He even reminded them of Saul when they wanted a king, how God gave them Saul. And that wasn't a very good decision. Uh, it it kind of led them down the path of some difficulty. But then he brings them to David. And all the Israelites knew, they remember with glory. You know, like we in the church, we remember the glory years of the 50s, right? We remember the glory years of the 50s and how, oh, churches were packed. And, you know, everybody was packed on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And, oh, if we could just get back there again, oh, everything would be wonderful. Well, that's what the Israelites remembered about King David. They forgot about all the, you know, the Absalom, his own son, tried to kill him and take over the kingdom. They forgot about David's shortcomings in his own personal life. We always, we always look back with rose-colored glasses, don't we? We always look back at the past and say, oh, how, if we could just go back there. No, if we'd go back there, we'd remember there was a whole lot of difficulty and stress and strife even during that time. But the thing is, the good hand of God carried us through and put his peace and his blessing on us so much during those times that we forget the difficult times because we remember how good God is. And that's exactly what Paul's trying to get them to remember. Hey, God was that way then. Guess what? He's still that way now. And through the lineage of David, God has given you your purpose. Your purpose was to usher in the Savior of the world. You were made, you were chosen for a purpose. That purpose was to, you were made great for Jesus. You prospered for Jesus. You are the lineage of the Savior of the world. God is telling, uh, Paul is telling this, this, uh, this group in the synagogue, much like Peter said at, at Pentecost, much like Stephen preached when he was, right before he was stoned, he's reminding the Israelites who you are. You're not great because you're an Israelite. You're great because of who God is. In church, can I tell you this? I don't care what size a church gets to be, how little, how big, how small, how many people, how few people. We're not great because we, are, we have First Baptist on our name. We're not great because we're in Landrum. We're great because of who God is. We're great because of what he's going to do and what he wants to do and what he desires to do in this place and in our individual lives. Paul was reminding them of the promise. He said in that last verse we just read, from the, from the descendants of this man, talking about David, according to promise. God promised that there would be one who would, who would follow in the lineage of David who would take over the throne never to give it up again. Jesus is that person. It wasn't some individual king. It was the Savior, the Messiah, and he's done just that. Paul pointing directly to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we need to be reminded of who we are. We need to be reminded of what God has done for us, how God has blessed us. I I said earlier in the first service, I can't remember who said it. Uh, I heard it. I heard a pastor say it one time, but I've forgotten who it was, so now I can take credit for it. Um, and the statement is this, the greatest, you've heard me say it before, the greatest testimony of what God will do in the future is what God has done in the past. And look at what God has done in the past. Look at how he has healed. Look at how he has restored. Look at how he has blessed. Look at all the things he's done. And if we'll look at those things, how he treated the nation of Israel, we can see exactly what he'll do in his church. We can see exactly what he'll do in the life of the believer whose heart is set toward him. So Paul reminds them of their heritage. He reminds them of their their history, and he also reminds them of their future. But secondly, as we think about the promises of God here and the promises in that reminder, we think about uh, the promises of God and the the simple truth of the fulfilled promise. And right after he mentions that uh, in verse um, uh, uh, 23, he goes into verse 24, and he kind of takes a little discourse, and he says, after John had proclaimed before his coming, a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And while John was contemplating or completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family and those who among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. 
And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. And when they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. Now, I want to stop just there for a minute because I want to stop at the end of verse 29. And we think about the simple truth. We see the, the, the simple truth of the promise, the fulfilled promise rejected. Paul reminds them, just like I said, just like Peter did at Pentecost, just like Stephen did before his stone. He reminds them of exactly what the Jews did to Jesus. Here's the Savior. Here's the lineage of David. Here's all these things that you hear read about every single week. Can I just say, I think Paul is is being very pointed here. He's saying, just like what happened a few moments ago in that service that morning, someone stood up and they read some of the law of Moses. Someone stood up and they read many of the prophecies of the Scripture. And I guarantee you, every time the prophecies that were, writ, were, that were read, many of them, if, all, if not all of them, were pointing to a Messiah. They were talking about this Messiah, this, this one that's going to come, this one that's going to make everything right, this one that's going to sit on the throne, this one that's going to restore things to back to the way they should be. They've just read that, and, and, and Paul says... The, these prophecies and everything that you've heard read over and over and over again, you've completely missed. Can I ask a question? How, how long do we have to sit in church and hear the Word of God talk, hear the Word of God read, sing songs about God, until we get out of our pews and go to work for Him? You know, uh, we, we about, I guess about a month ago, not quite a month ago now, three weeks ago, we celebrated graduation. We celebrated I don't know, there's about 13 students up here who either graduated from high school or graduated from college. How ridiculous would it be, of course, in our society, it's not as ridiculous as it used to be, but how ridiculous is it to think those kids are going to graduate from college, graduate from high school, and then just come home and, and sit in the house? Just sit there and look, look, at, look at you and, you know, play video games or just sit in the house and not do anything, never use any of their education. Um, they're, they're not going to do anything. They're just going to they're just going to sit around. How, how many of you would, would, would that would be okay with that if your kid did that? In, in your, maybe you would. I wouldn't be. Uh, you know, because graduation means what? Graduation means time to be an adult. Graduation means time to, you know, if, if whether it's high school, college, whatever, it's time to get a job. It's time to take care of yourself. It's time to begin to to do things for yourself. You know, I, I think in church we've forgotten the idea of graduation. We think it's okay to, to sit in class for the rest of our life and never do anything. You know, God didn't come to save us. God didn't come to save the nation of Israel. What Paul's basically telling them, the Savior's come. You've, you've had all these prophecies for all of your existence. You heard this read every week, and yet you completely missed the very one who fulfilled every one of them. He showed you the miracles. He showed you the healings. He showed you the... Uh, uh, the, the, provide, the provision of food. He showed you raising the dead to life, give, making the lame walk. He showed you all these things, but yet you condemned him. In verse 28, it says, And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. And they carried out all these things and laid him in a tomb. Paul's giving a, a very brief discourse just to get to a point. He said, Now, you did all that. So I, I remember that the promise has been fulfilled, though. Because you just work together in the promise. You just work together in the prophecy to be a part of it because you ask him to be crucified. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem and the very ones who were now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that he raised up Jesus as it is written, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, so they have begotten you. And then he goes on in verses 34 and 35 to talk about how that Jesus is greater than David. You all want to, he says, y'all want to talk about David, David, David. David's in a tomb decaying. David's body has been wasted away. We've got one here who didn't undergo decay. He was put in a tomb, he was killed, but he didn't undergo decay because God raised him up. And he's raised him up, and this is the one who's going to sit on the throne of David. This is the one who's going to restore everything like it ought to be, but not like you think. He's going to restore 
He's going to restore everything. He's not just going to restore Israel. He wants to restore everyone. He come to provide life and life to the fullest. He served God's purpose. He reminded them of his rejection. He reminded them of God's resurrection. He reminded them of, of, of God raising him up. And the, the reason he was raised up was not just to put on a show. The reason he was raised was to prove who he was. The reason he was raised was to show that everything he said when he was on earth, everything that he preached, everything that he taught, it wasn't about the miracles. It wasn't, that wasn't what Jesus was about. Jesus did great miracles, and he can still do great miracles today. But I want to tell you what, every time Jesus did a miracle, it was to gain attention so that he could tell the message of who he was so that the greatest miracle could happen. Because I'm going to tell you what, every person Jesus raised from the dead died again. Every person Jesus gave their sight went to a tomb. Every person Jesus uh, gave their speech or, or, or restored a limb or, or made the lame walk or whatever, every one of those people ended up going to a grave. And the greatest tragedy that could ever happen is for Jesus to restore sight, make the lame walk, resurrect the dead, and someone not accept the greatest gift that he came to give, and that's eternal life. Eternal peace. Not just temporary. All those other healings were temporary. The only healing that was eternal. That's why Jesus said, you see these works that I do? You'll do greater works than these. Because the works that we do for the Lord are for eternal purposes. Not for temporary. I'm not saying God doesn't still do those things. God doesn't still heal. But I want to tell you what. The ultimate healing we all need is the healing from sin. The healing from corruption. The healing and forgiveness of Christ. For eternal salvation. The promise of God fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And Paul talks about all those things and he comes down finally to the, 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 the last truth and that last promise and that's the promise of restoration. Verses 38 and 39, Paul says, he begins that word, that verse with the word therefore. And, and I know we talk about that a lot, but basically he's saying, based on everything that I've just told you, based on the history and that the, the history of what God did from the original promise back in Genesis and to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to, the, to our forefathers, the, the, the promise to King David, the promise to uh, how God delivered us from Egypt, all those things leading up to all he did for you in Israel, all he did through, through David, your, the crucifixion, the resurrection, based on all of that, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. <laughs> That's the most important. Paul, all that other stuff is for this reason. So you can know that you can be forgiven. You can know that everything you've tried to do with the law, everything you've tried to do, look at verse 39, it says, and through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Paul says everything you're trying to do with all your works, all the laws, all these regulations and restrictions, everything you're trying to do to free yourself is just putting you under more bondage. But I'm going to tell you, there's one who came to do one thing only, and that is to free you from everything that you're trying to be freed from. And the way you get that freedom is through the forgiveness of sin. Because I want to tell you what, sin is an accuser. Satan is an accuser. He wants to heap guilt and uh, everything on top of us. He wants us to always remember all the wrong things we've done and never remember what God has done. And what Paul is trying to say is Jesus came to do that. He came to free you. He came to liberate you. He came to show you that there is a better, more perfect, more excellent way, and that is through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the promise of restoration. Therefore, based on all that Jesus is, based on all that he's done, you can have forgiveness. Remember we said a moment ago, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. You know the greatest way he cared for you? Romans 5, 8 says that while we were still sinners, while we were still antagonistic toward God, while we were still opposed to him, Christ came and died for us. He came and went to a cross. He did something that not a single one of us would do for anybody else in this room. He took punishment 
He took, but, but the pun, look, getting nails driven through his wrists and in his feet, getting beaten uh, to beyond recognition. Do you realize that that was, that was the least, that was the least thing that Jesus dealt with? The thing that, that, that Jesus dealt with the most was he dealt with the rejection of his father. When, when God the Father, when, when all of the sin of the world was placed on Christ and, and God turned away, that, that was the greatest hurt that Christ felt. But you know what? He'd do it again if he had to for you and for me. Thankfully, he doesn't have to. Hebrews tells us that there's one, there's one death. There's one satisfaction, and Jesus has done it. And you know what? All I have to do is accept that. All I have to do, it says, if you will simply believe. You know, for us, that seems so simple, doesn't it? But can I tell you that's difficult for a lot of people? Just like it was difficult for the Jews. You know why it was difficult for them? Because they felt like they had to do something to earn it. And just like in our society today, we, we think we have to do something to earn it. It can't be that easy. But the scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But a free gift is nothing if it's not received. I can offer you a gift all day long, but if you don't receive it, it's not effective. Will you Receive that gift today so that you can be freed in your life. It's kind of like Peter Eldersfeld who told a story about a rich man, Christian man, who had a large company of employees. Many of them owed him money. He had loaned the money for different things and they owed him. He was constantly trying to teach these people something about Christianity. And one day it hit him, a plan hit upon him. He posted a notice for his employees to see that said, all those who will come to my office between 11 and 12 o'clock on Thursday morning to present an honest statement of their debts will have them canceled at once. The debtors read the notice with a great deal of skepticism. And on Thursday morning, although they gathered in the street in front of his office, not one of them went to the door. Instead, they gossiped, they complained, about their employer, and ridiculed the notice that he had posted. They said it didn't make sense. But finally, at 11.45 a.m., one man jumped forward, dashed up the steps into the office, and presented his statement. Why are you here? The rich business owner asked. Because you promised to cancel the debts of all those who come as you instructed, the young man replied. And do you believe the promise? Yes, I do. Why do you believe it? Persisted the employer. Because although it was too much for me to understand, I know that you are a good man and would not deceive anyone. The rich man took the bill and marked it, paid in full. At which time the poor man, overcome, cried out, I knew it. I told them so. They said it couldn't be true, and now I'm going going out to show them. Wait, said the benefactor. It's not quite 12 o'clock. The others are not entitled to any special proof of my sincerity. When the clock struck 12, the forgiven debtor ran out, waving his receipt in the face of his fellows. With a mad rush, they made for the door, but it was too late. The door was locked. You see, God has also promised to cancel your debt to sin or your debt of sin, not because of your righteousness, but because of his. The question is, have you believed him? He's given us his word. He's posted the notice. And a lot of people say, that just doesn't make sense. There's no reason you should do that. They've gathered outside and criticized and ridiculed and gossiped about who God is and what does he really mean by that when all he's asking is for you to come in and say I believe you why because you're a good God 
and you wouldn't deceive anybody. So if my Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life, who am I to question that? Because you see, it's not based on my goodness. It's not based on my righteousness. It's based on his. And God is here today to call out to you to say, won't you just believe? If you're here today and you've never believed in Christ, that gift is still available. It's still there. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to keep up with anything. You don't have to show up at anything. All you got to do is believe, and he'll do the rest. The question is, will you? Will you trust his goodness? Will you trust his grace that he'll do it for us?